Well, thank you so much for that uh, warm uh, welcome. Uh, this is almost like a second home for me here at Grace Community Church, and John MacArthur is my all-time, all-time favorite preacher, and I love being here and being able to sit under his preaching, and I've made so many friends. I've had four children who have attended and graduated from the Master's College, and I have the joy of teaching at the seminary and working at the uh, with uh, the college some, and so it's just a, a, a great privilege to be back here at Grace Community Church. And this is an exciting evening and tomorrow morning. Uh, the series is entitled Men Who Rock the World, and what we started two years ago was looking at the Reformers, and we looked at Martin Luther and William Tyndale, John Calvin, John Knox, and the shockwaves that were sent out from their ministries as they recovered the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. At the very base of what they recovered was sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, solus Christos, and soli deo gloria, which is Scripture alone, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and this for the glory of God alone. And after a thousand years of much darkness, uh, the church came back to the Word of God and recovered the saving message of Jesus Christ and launched, really, a, a, a new era in church history. And then last year, we looked at standing on the shoulders of the Reformers were the Puritans. The Reformers were in the 16th century, and the Puritans were in the 17th century. And as we looked at them, we saw how God used them mightily uh, to extend what began with the Reformation. And so tonight and tomorrow, we're going to look at our third installment in church history. We're going to look at the Great Awakening and those men who were involved in this incredible movement of the Spirit of God upon American soil that had its effect upon the world. And Lord willing, next year we're going to look at the Victorians with Spurgeon and J.C. Ryle and, and great men like that. And then in two years, we're going to take it full circle and we're going to look at the evangelicals and Martin Lloyd-Jones and James Montgomery Boyce and R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur. <laughs> so we, we will go from Martin Luther to John MacArthur and we will have spanned 500 years, and we will have investigated these men who rocked the world. And there's much value for us in, in studying these men because they become uh, inspirational, uh, they become instructional. Uh, Paul said, follow me as I follow the Lord, and we all need people in the Christian faith who are further down the path than we are and who are following the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what discipleship is, right? Uh, it is someone else who's following Christ, and we follow that person, and their influence helps mold and shape us. They become like a, a mentor to us. Well, as we study these figures in church history, that really, in large measure, is the value for our spiritual life. In fact, it becomes very devotional. Uh, it's not only instructing the mind, but it also ignites the heart as well and, in, and uh, calls out for greater commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, from our very lives. And so that's my desire as we look at the Great Awakening, uh, the revivalists of the Great Awakening, that God will use this not only to teach you some history but also to ignite a fire of passion for God in your soul. That, that is our desire. So, tonight, uh, I want to do two things with you. In our first session, I want to give you an overview of the Great Awakening. I want to give you a view from 36,000 feet, a flyover of uh, the Great Awakening. We'll take a break. And then we'll come back, and I want us to begin with Jonathan Edwards. And you're going to want to be here for Jonathan Edwards. But let's begin now, big picture, 
with the Great Awakening. I think it is safe to say that the Great Awakening was the greatest movement of the Spirit of God on American soil ever. Uh, To give you a historical uh, perspective, the Great Awakening took place specifically in the 1730s and in the 1740s. Uh, Up and down the eastern seacoast during a time in which uh, our nation had not yet become a nation. And the Great Awakening, I believe, would lay a a moral foundation uh, for the birth of our country. But by way of beginning, what is an awakening? An awakening is a time of revival. By the term awakening, it implies that the church is asleep, that the people of God have Uh, are in a state of slumber, and they are sluggish towards the things of God. Uh, They are slow in responding to the Lord, and they are in uh, in a dull spiritual state. And in a time of awakening, God does just that. God, by the ministry of His Spirit and by the ministry of His Word, He awakens His people to His own holiness. And there it is as though the veil is pulled back, and through the Word of God and through the preaching of the Word of God, the the knowledge of the holiness of God is suddenly restored in the church. God raises up preachers, and God raises up heralds who preach the holiness of God, and the church, which has been asleep, is awakened. And as they are awakened to a, to a new uh, understanding of the purity and the transcendence and the perfection of God, they suddenly become aware of their own, their own sin and their own spiritual apathy and their own spiritual lukewarmness. And as they are aware of their own sin, they come under deep conviction of their sin, and their hearts are are crushed, and their hearts are broken because they're suddenly aware that they have been wasting their spiritual life. And so they call upon the name of the Lord, and they they turn to God with a, a sense of brokenness and with a sense of desperation and with deep earnestness of soul, they, they humble themselves under the Lord, and they have rekindled within their own soul a, a, a new passion for God, a, a new excitement for the Lord that should have been there all along, but now they are awakened to the beauty of God's holiness, and they now are restored, and they are replenished in their walk with the Lord, and they are alive unto God. And now they have a a new appetite for the things of God, and they have a new love for for the Word of God. And they also now begin to live lives in the pursuit of holiness. Uh, where they have become entangled in the things of the world and and drawn into uh, those things of of worldliness. Now they're awakened to to where they have been, and now they desire to forsake uh, those things that have sapped their spiritual vigor and energy, and they now redouble their, their commitment to the Lord. And they begin to, to, they love the Word of God. And church suddenly becomes the place where they want to be. And there's a new excitement in their life. And there is a new excitement in the church. And the people are awake. And they are alive unto God in, in the fullest sense. But it doesn't stop there. It, it spills over out of the church and into the world. And because there is such a difference now between the church and the world, uh, the world now is drawn. They see the difference, and they hear the preaching of the Word of God, 
And God gives success to the preaching of the Word of God in ways that, that, that those paths had been formerly uh, uh, blocked off. And so now, sinners come under conviction of sin, uh, where they have been hard-hearted, where they have been uncircumcised of heart, where, where they have been stiff-necked, where, where they have been entangled and caught up in, in all of the things of their sin. They now wake up. And they now realize that we are, we are a long way off from God. And they call upon the name of the Lord. And there is, there is such a, a power in the ministry of the Holy Spirit that unbelievers now come under a deep awareness of their separation from God. And they are aware that they are under the wrath of God. And they are desperate to, to be made right with God and to escape uh, the coming day of judgment. And they suddenly become aware of eternal things and eternal matters where they have been living with such a, a limited view of only this world and the here and now. Suddenly they are lifted up in their, in their thinking, and they have an eternal perspective. They call upon the name of the Lord. They are crushed, and they are broken, and they enter in through the narrow gate. That is what an awakening is. And an awakening can happen in one person's life. An awakening can happen within a church. An awakening can happen among a number of churches, it can happen within a city, it can happen within a region, it can have an even larger effect, and then the fruit of an awakening is such that missionaries are now raised up by the droves, and they are sent out to the corners of the earth, and the church now is so awake and so uh, so alert and so sharp in her vision as she now sees as God sees and has a heart and a passion to reach the world with the gospel. And it becomes a harvest time. And it becomes a time in which unbelievers are, are swept into the kingdom of God. And not just one at a time, although everyone that is saved is saved individually, but there is a, a large number of, of those who are harvested and brought into the kingdom of God. You know, that's exactly what needs to happen in America right now. That is exactly what needs to happen in the churches of America. This is exactly what needs to happen in our lives here tonight. Uh, for us to be awakened all the more, no matter where we are in our spiritual life, there is always still so much more of God for us to experience in our soul. Well, this is exactly what happened back in the 1730s and the 1740s, and it wasn't just an awakening, it was the great awakening, a, a time unparalleled and unprecedented uh, in what had gone before, and we certainly have not seen the likes of it since. Now, I want to talk about the awakening needed as we begin, because as in that time that preceded the Great Awakening, uh, there was an enormous need. And this should encourage us, because awakenings always come when the church is most asleep. Uh, awakenings come when the church is at her weakest. And so, as we look back into the 1600s, uh, we need to understand it was a time of spiritual deadness. Uh, certainly in England and Scotland and, and in that part of the world, but especially England with the Church of England, uh, it was a time of spiritual decline. Uh, 1662 was the time of the Great Ejection. 
And on August 24th, 1662, 2,000 Puritan preachers were ejected from their pulpits. 2,000 of the greatest preachers to ever walk this earth. Certainly, perhaps the greatest generation of preachers on the whole were put out of their pulpits in that one year, and it left the Church of England in a state uh, with a spiritual vacuum. Her greatest preachers are put out. The ones that are left behind, for the most part, are those who were in a slumber and who were in a sleep. And as they filled their pulpits, the emphasis was on oratory. Uh, The emphasis was upon ritual and routine and the coldness of of worship, and the church was sinking into a quagmire. Uh, The pulpit was a barren place of dry oratorical homilies. And that spilled over into society because when the light is not shining into the world, we who are the light of the world, we who are the salt of the earth, when the salt loses its savor, and when the light is hidden under a bushel, the effect upon the world is the world progresses quickly and rapidly into a state of spiritual uh, uh, filth and immorality, and that's exactly what took place in England, drunkenness, gambling, uh, cruelty to children and, and women, and deplorable vices. That was in England. And over here in the colonies, those who had first come to the colonies, the pilgrims and the early Puritans, were so strong in their faith. Uh, They were so singular in their vision. But with each successive generation, there was a downward spiral until by the time of the end of the 1600s, uh, the colonies here in the United States were, were, were lacking the passion of their forefathers. And the population of the colonies was increasing, but those who were converted and genuinely knew the Lord in proportion were decreasing. And so that is something of the state of, of the church. Arminianism was flourishing, which is a man-centered view of theology. If there has ever been an oxymoron, it is Arminian theology. It is a man-centered study of God. That is a total contradiction. Antinomianism was flourishing, which was uh, such a, a, a laxity and a tolerance towards, uh, towards sin that it matters not what someone does with their life, how they live. You throw in English deism and the church and the, and the colonial society had declined into uh, a quagmire. And also, there were now baptized infants in churches, those churches that practiced infant baptism, And there was a lack of emphasis upon conversion. And there was no talk of being born again and having a personal encounter with the living, risen Christ. And so churches had become uh, filled with religious people who did not know the Lord. So all of that was taking place. And so as a, a compromise to try to to hold this all together, uh, many of the colonial churches adopted a compromise design known as the halfway covenant. And the halfway covenant allowed those people who were unconverted into the membership of the church as long as they were not an embarrassment to the church And as they were taken into membership, they would then baptize their children. And so the parents were lost, the children were lost, and it wasn't long before there were as many unconverted people in church 
as they were converted. In fact, in many places, there were more unsaved people in the church as members than those who truly knew the Lord. So there was a man named Solomon Stoddard. You need to remember that name, Solomon Stoddard, because he will be the grandfather of Jonathan Edwards. And Solomon Stoddard came up with a plan. He had a design that he would use the Lord's table as a converting means. In other words, he would invite unbelievers to come to the Lord's table as members of the church in the hope that they will be converted by taking the Lord's Supper as an unbeliever. Well, that was the fly in Solomon Stoddard's ointment. But other than that, he was a very strong spiritual leader. Uh, he was the pastor of the Northampton Church that Jonathan Edwards himself would later pastor, and he was the pastor there for 60 long years. In fact, he was known as the Pope of the Connecticut River Valley. He cast a, a long shadow over that entire area, and, and um, Solomon Stoddard uh, will be a very strong force in this subject of revival. But I want us to continue to talk about this need for, for, for an awakening to come to the early colonies. Uh, the first school to be established in the colonies was Harvard. And Harvard was established, uh, I think, in 1620 in order that there would be reformed Calvinistic ministers of the Word of God. Uh, there in Boston or Cambridge, just outside of Boston, Harvard was established for this highest purpose to train ministers of the gospel, specifically those who were reformed, those who were Calvinistic, those who had a high view of the sovereignty of God, but Harvard was on the downward spiral. And Harvard had come under the influence of Arminianism. And Harvard had come under the influence of antinomianism. And Harvard had come under the influence of uh, the rationalism of the Enlightenment. And Harvard, which was the leading influence in the early colonies of supplying its ministers, was becoming a polluted pool from which to draw ministers in this, in this area. And so Solomon Stoddard was, was really raised up by God to be uh, a counter force uh, against the, the decline of the church. And Solomon Stoddard believed that they needed awakening. He believed that they needed a revival. He, he believed that the church so desperately needed to be awakened from its spiritual slumber, and Solomon Stoddard realized that so much of the church was comprised of those who were unregenerate and who had never committed their life to Jesus Christ. And so Stoddard said, I have made it my business to gain souls to Christ. And the church would be the first mission field uh, for, his, for his outreach. And he believed that powerful preaching was the means that God would use to, to draw sinners to Christ. Uh, Stoddard warned of the threat of damnation. He was a hellfire and brimstone kind of preacher. And by the way, you know what you call a hellfire preacher? A Bible preacher. <laughs> That's what you call a hellfire preacher. He, he's a Bible preacher, and Stoddard was a Bible preacher, and he believed that the, the dread of hell was the most effective means to awaken slumbering church members out of their stupor, that they would call upon the name of the Lord and heaven shaken them to the very foundation of their soul. Uh, he then offered the grace of God and the salvation to rescue sinners from eternal ruin 
And he insisted the Spirit of the Lord must be poured out upon the people, else religion will not revive. So it was in this context now that Solomon started desires to see uh, uh, a season of revival that the Spirit of God would work powerfully in accompanying the preaching of the Word of God. And he believed that the church should expect seasons of revival, times of intense ministry of the Spirit of God in the hearts of God's people, as well as to awaken those who were unconverted. And he believed that only God could bring such a revival. He did not believe that it could be manipulated. He did not believe that it could be conjured up by man with his methodology. He believed that there were two prerequisites for a spiritual awakening, and it is the intense prayers of God's people that God would come and visit His people with purifying power, and that God would raise up preachers of the Word of God to herald the, the message of, of the grace of God, and that those would be the two means by which God would work to, to usher in a revival, yet it would be at the sovereign choice and discretion of God alone. Stoddard insisted, we should beg of God that religion may revive in the land. There was another Puritan, colonial Puritan named Cotton Mather, who was a colonial minister, and he said, we should pray that there may be a plentiful effusion of the Holy Spirit on the world. Then will converting work go forward among the nations. And that is one thing we need to understand about these colonial Puritans. They wanted God to bring a revival to their region that would have its effect upon the entire world. They wanted God to do something in their churches that would send out a ripple effect to the four corners of the earth. And so they were pleading with God to, to bring such an awakening to New England that would have its ultimate effect upon the gathering in of the heathens and around the world. And so Mather pleaded with God, Oh, that the Jewish nation were converted. Oh, that the fullness of the Gentiles were come in. Oh, that our Lord Jesus Christ would come and take possession of the world for Himself. And so that was the Puritan hope, that God would bring an awakening to their land that would have its effect upon the nations. And so the pastors began... To, to gather together and to band together in prayer. And Timothy Edwards, who was Jonathan Edwards' father, was one of those pastors along with others in this Connecticut River Valley who came together and with intense prayer called upon the name of the Lord to restore His name in the land, to raise up a standard again of righteousness that the church would be a city set on a hill, that the light would go forth from the pulpits of New England that would shine in such a way that the church in New England would be revived and that it would have its ultimate effect upon the nations of the world. What, what, a, what an extraordinary vision and focus of these colonial Puritan pastors had. And so this leads us to the first evidences of an awakening outside of this Connecticut River Valley, down in what we would call the middle colonies, really the upper part of the middle colonies in New Jersey. Uh, there came a Dutch Reformed pastor named Theodore Freeling Heisen. Now, you cannot be more Reformed than a Dutch Reformed. Th they are so far to the right, they, they, they are to the right of John Calvin, okay? Th they are very Reformed. And Freelingheisen was sent from Holland in 
to come to the rural area of New Jersey in order to minister to Dutch-speaking people. And when he came in 1720, what he discovered in the Dutch-speaking congregations is that these are unregenerate people. And these people are just going through the motions, the empty motions of religiosity. They're just going through the empty motions of, of playing church. But they do not know the Lord. They are nice people. Uh, they are hardworking people. But they do not have the presence of the Lord in their lives. And so he set about to preach what had not been being preached that except you be born again, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He preached for personal conversion, that there must come a time when the Spirit of God pierces your heart, you come under the heavy weight of the awareness of your sin, that you repent of your sin, and with deep brokenness, you call upon the Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Freelingheisen pressed hard upon these Dutch-speaking uh, people that they must be personally converted. They must be individually born again. And the necessity was they had to demonstrate it with a changed life, that there would be the fruit of repentance. And there would be the fruit of, of, of a righteous life that would be flowing from their life. Well, these congregations were so upset about this, they sent message all the way back to the Netherlands, to, to Amsterdam. They wanted Freeling Heisen removed. And that is usually the outcome of a minister who preaches such a message like this. But their efforts failed, and he continued to preach for genuine conversions, and in due season, God began to visit these congregations. And those members who had long been spiritually asleep, uh, in, in a dead slumber, unable to see or to hear spiritual realities, they were awakened under the powerful preaching of Theodore Freelingheisen, and this now caused a division in the churches. And there is a division between those who are genuinely converted and those who are religious but unconverted, and there is always this controversy and always this conflict in times of awakening. They are never what we would say long-lasting, peaceful situations, because it stirs things up, and certain things come to the, issue, uh, come to the surface. And, and those who are not born again become very defensive, and they do not like the status quo to be changed. Uh, they want everything to remain the same as it was from the beginning. And charter members begin to have their feathers ruffled, and, and those who don't like for their church to be undergoing this kind of radical change, well, the fact is it was nothing more than Jesus Christ now coming to church. Uh, Christ now coming to visit His own church through this regenerated uh, membership. Well, Freelingheisen influenced a man named Gilbert Tennant. He was a Presbyterian. And he lived in Pennsylvania. And Gilbert Stewart, this Presbyterian minister, came under the influence of Freelingheisen's emphasis that you must be born again. You must be individually converted to Jesus Christ. Uh, your heart must be circumcised, and you must have new life put within you. So, Gilbert Tennant um, decided that he would pull together some young men who had thoughts and aspirations for the ministry, and he built a one-room building called the Log College. And his four sons were in the Log College. 
and there were about 10 or 11 other young ministers, and the Log College would ultimately become Princeton University. This was the first Presbyterian uh, training school for ministers. And in this little out-of-the-way, one-room schoolhouse, Gilbert Tennant, with the influence of Theodore Frelinghuysen uh, in his life, began to personally train and to pour his life into these 15 young men, and they would become fiery preachers during the Great Awakening, and they would become sons of thunder as they would preach and herald the Word of God, and they would become ministers for the Scotch-Irish immigrants who were flooding into the Pennsylvania and New York and New Jersey area. So, the Log College is a very important uh, fountain from which will come much truth for the Great Awakening. So, Gilbert Tennant, he patterned his ministry after Freelinghausen's evangelistic ministry, and this now created a ruckus in the Presbyterian church because, again, they, those in the Presbyterian church at this time in the colonies liked everything the way it was. They didn't want preachers shaking things up. They didn't want to have to self-examine their life. Uh, they didn't want to have to think, what is my testimony? Uh, they liked just coming to church and being patted on the head and just continuing to go through the motions and for church to become a, a social club rather than uh, what it should be, the body of Christ. And so it forced a, a split in the Presbyterians and those ministers in, who were part of the Log College were forced out of the Synod of Philadelphia and a new synod was started, and a synod here, a, a gathering of Presbyterian churches and Presbyterian ministers was formed in New Brunswick, uh, New Jersey, which will be very close to where Princeton will be, and was joined by the synod of New York, where other Presbyterian uh, ministers were remained committed to the pure teaching of the Word of God. And so these Presbyterian ministers, they now begin to preach the necessity of the new birth. Uh, they begin to preach for a personal conversion, and that those in the church are not necessarily going to heaven simply because they are in church. They must be in Christ in order to go to heaven. And so it became hotly contested during the, the, the Great Awakening. And what will proceed from this will be God raising up a young man by the name of Jonathan Edwards, who will become the key figure in this first stage of, of the Great Awakening. Now, I want to briefly talk about Jonathan Edwards. We're going to have a break in just a little bit, and then we'll do more of a careful walk through Jonathan Edwards. But Jonathan Edwards was the son of a minister. He attended Yale. Harvard was too liberal for his father to let his son go to, uh, to Harvard. And so there was a new school, the College of Connecticut, that had been started in New Haven, Connecticut, that would later be renamed Yale University. And so Jonathan Edwards, a brilliant young man, homeschooled by his father, he had he had ten sisters who all doted on him, and they were all six feet tall, and they were known as 60 feet of Edward's daughters. <laughs> and they, they, they were a very prominent family, and they were all sent off to finishing school in Boston. Uh, they were polished in their social graces and in their manners, and as they came home, can you imagine having 10 older sisters all just mothering you 
and your father teaching you who is a minister? And Jonathan Edwards is the product of this Puritan home and this Puritan upbringing, but he would not be converted until he was 17 years old. After he was converted at age 17, his life was dramatically changed. He, he eventually graduates from the master's degree program at, at, at Yale, and he becomes the assistant minister of Solomon Stoddard, who was the most influential minister in the area. And Solomon Stoddard at the time was 83 years old. And so as young Jonathan is, is called by the church to become their pastor, it is with the understanding that he will succeed Solomon Stoddard. Well, Solomon Stoddard very soon thereafter passes away, and at age 26, Jonathan Edwards assumes the pastorate and the pulpit of one of the most important and influential pulpits in all of New England. And Jonathan Edwards will become uh, the, the initial driving force for the great awakening that God will use. And in 1733, Jonathan Edwards preaches two sermons on justification by faith alone because he was pressing for personal conversion. And as a result of his preaching these two sermons on justification by faith alone, people in the church began to be converted to Christ. And Edwards preached many other sermons. And in Northampton, a, a little town of about 1,100 people, in a relatively short period of time, there were 300 conversions in the town of 1,100 people. It was an extraordinary movement of the Spirit of God, and we'll talk about this more in the next session. And so, this revival that, that came as a result of Edwards preaching, and Edwards writes a letter to give the, re the account of what is going on, that letter becomes expanded a bit by Edwards, it is mailed across the Atlantic Ocean, and it comes to the desk of Isaac Watts, the great hymn writer. And Isaac Watts reads this, and he rejoices in his heart and spirit. And Isaac Watts, along with another minister, they write a preface to what Jonathan Edwards wrote, and it suddenly spreads around England, and uh, there is a renewed interest for an awakening. There is a renewed emphasis upon a spiritual revival. And Edwards will write other books, and he will preach other sermons, not the least of which is sinners in the hands of an angry God. And suddenly the Word of God is running swiftly in the, in the colonies, and people are becoming very zealous. Uh, and there is a young man named James Davenport who begins to be a, a fiery preacher. And in all of these revivalistic preachers, they are, they are strong, they are passionate, they, they are fervent. And he goes a little bit too far, James, James Davenport, and he denounces all ministers who oppose the revival as being wolves in sheep clothing. As, as being unconverted themselves. Well, this creates an even greater wedge now between the, those who are for the revival and those who are against the revival. Those who are for the revival are for the preaching of the Word of God and for the necessity of a personal uh, experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who are against the revival are those who think that just because you're in the church and have been baptized or sprinkled as a baby, that you now are in a state of acceptance with a holy God in heaven. And it creates quite a tension back and forth until it comes to 
to, to, to hit a fever point at Yale, and the faculty are basically against the revival, and the student body is for the revival because they're being converted. And there is a board of trustees meeting, and Jonathan Edwards is there, and Jonathan Edwards is to address the entire student body the next day, and Jonathan Edwards brings one of the most riveting sermons that he would ever preach in his life, and he preaches a message called The Distinguishing Marks of a Work of God's Spirit. And he takes 1 John 4, 1 through 6, and he shows the five distinguishing marks of a true revival, the five distinguishing marks of an authentic, true conversion and an authentic, true spirituality. And it would eventually be expanded and put into print, and Jonathan Edwards was the man that God used to first light the fuse for the Great Awakening, but it is still somewhat regionalized. Enter George Whitfield. And in 1739, and we'll look at Whitfield tomorrow morning. In 1739, George Whitfield comes to the colonies. He comes at the end of 1739. He will leave at the beginning of 1741. And for the year of 1740, George Whitfield will go from Maine to Georgia. He will go to Philadelphia, New York City, Boston, Savannah, Charleston, every major city in the colonies. And he will be such a force for God that he will preach the Word of God with such power that when he goes to Philadelphia, he will preach to more than twice the population of Philadelphia. When Philadelphia was a city of some 12 to 13,000 people, there will be more than twice the population gathered to hear Whitfield preach. He will go to New York City. It will be the largest gathering that has ever taken place in the colonies. And George Whitfield will be the man with the torch of truth in his hand who will go from city to city, and his preaching journey of 1740 has been said to be the greatest preaching tour of any preacher in the history of the church since the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. That is quite a statement, my friend. But what happened through the preaching of Whitfield is absolutely astonishing. And as one uh, historian has said, it was Jonathan Edwards that lit the fuse. It was George Whitfield who blew it into a furnace. As now he is lighting up the, the eastern seacoast with the preaching of the Word of God. And it's going to be hard for them to follow on these, these uh, overheads right now because I'm going to have to pull this all together rather quickly. But as, as George Whitfield preaches, here's what you need to know. 80% of all of the colonists heard him preach. More people saw George Whitfield than ever came close to seeing George Washington. He was the unifying force of the early colonies. And some historians call George Whitfield the true founding father of America because it was his preaching that unified the colonies in so many ways, and it is estimated that perhaps one out of every ten colonists was converted at this time and brought to a saving knowledge of of Jesus Christ. And Whitfield was, was so powerful, and he did it without any altar calls. He, he did it without any personal workers. He, he did it without any decision cards. He simply preached the Word of God 
and left people to deal with God within their soul, and the accounts of the people that were converted is absolutely amazing. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to read you an account of one man who was converted under the preaching of Whitfield. Every time I read this, it thrills my heart to see how God is so at work in saving sinners and bringing them to Himself. Well, Whitfield would cross the Atlantic Ocean 13 times. He would come to the, to the colonies seven times. Uh, he would spend three years of his life on a ship crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the quickest trip was two months. The longest trip was four months. And he would spend a major part of his time uh, on ships writing his letters and, and fine-tuning his sermons and preaching to everyone who was on the ships and be prayed up and be rested. And when that ship would make landfall, he was ready to step off and to preach the Word of God. The last thing that you need to know is that this, this great awakening that was so strong in New England and then so strong in the middle colonies, it made its way down into the south, and it would be in the south that there would be the beginnings of, of, of spreading Baptist churches as a result of the great awakening. It would be the spreading of Presbyterian churches in the South as a result of the Great Awakening. Uh, Presbyterian ministers increased more than doubled during this time from 45 to more than 100 ministers. During this time, there would be 300 new Bible-believing evangelical churches that would be spontaneously birthed as a result of the preaching of the Great Awakening. There would be 150 congregational churches that would be birthed during the time of the Great Awakening. In fact, when Whitfield dies, he dies uh, coming back to check on one of these churches. And he is now buried under the pulpit in Newburyport, Massachusetts, under one of these new churches, the Old South Presbyterian Church, uh, as he had come to to almost like Paul on a missionary journey to come back to the churches that had helped plant, uh, to see how they were progressing. God was so at work. God was so at, uh, on the move during this, during this time, and it would also lead to the birth of the modern missions movement, uh, which will begin with, with William Carey, but there will be a man we'll look at him tomorrow, who will die in the home of Jonathan Edwards. At the age of 29, his name was David Brainerd, and Jonathan Edwards will take the diary of David Brainerd, who was a missionary to the Native Americans, to the Indians, there in the area, and it will be this diary that William Carey will read that Adam Nine Judson will read, read, that Henry Martin will read, and it will be the octane in their tank that will propel them in the work of missions, and it will be the most, the most published work that Edwards would ever write. He didn't even write it. He simply took the diary of Edwards, uh, of Brainerd, and had it published after Brainerd dies in his home, and it will be the diary of David Brainerd and a biography that Edwards will write of David Brainerd that will be the missionary classic that missionaries in future generations will read, and it will propel them to the mission field, and it will also be out of the Great Awakening that the Ivy League schools will start. Uh, Harvard was already going. Yale was raised up before the Great Awakening started. But Princeton will come to fruition as a result of the Great Awakening. The University of Pennsylvania uh, actually had its start in a building that Benjamin Franklin had built for George Whitfield to preach. It would hold about 3,000 people. It was a tabernacle. 
But there were so many thousands of people coming to hear Whitfield preach that what Benjamin Franklin built for Whitfield was never even used once. And so the building actually became the birthplace for the Ivy League school, the University of Pennsylvania, or the University of, of Penn. And as a result of David Brainerd, his ministry to the, to the Indians, Dartmouth College would be started in an attempt to give education to Indians and the Baptists not to be left out. They started Brown University and the Dutch Reformed as a result of the Great Awakening. They started Rutgers University. Each of these Ivy League schools were raised up as a result of the Great Awakening and oh, how they have fallen since their glorious beginning. But let us understand the effect of the Great Awakening, and it would be as a result of this new morality in the land that there would be the American Revolutionary War fought and the birth of our country. And in fact, the American Revolutionary War was called by some historians the Presbyterian War because they've already gone to war with King George once in England, now we'll go to war with him on this side of the ocean. But out of this great awakening came really the evangelistic zeal and the moral fiber that would lay a foundation for the birthing of our nation. Not that our nation was necessarily a Christian nation per se, but there was the thunder of the preaching of the Word of God that was echoing in the ears of so many of the colonists as they came together to start this nation. I think this is a good place for us to, to bring this to conclusion, but as we have looked at the Great Awakening, how we need another Great Awakening in this land again. The church is in slumber. The church is asleep. The pulpits are as brass. Our nation is in moral decadence. The only way for this nation to be turned around would be for a heaven-sent, God-glorifying, Christ-preaching revival to be sent from heaven once again. And it will always begin with the church. And it starts with the church and then spills out in its effect upon the world. So judgment must begin with the house of God. And an awakening must begin with the people of God. And so may God do it yet again in this day. And when it seems as though society could not be any more godless, it is in the midnight hour that He sends the shining light of His gospel truth, and He sends the power of the Holy Spirit, and how we need to pray, and how we need to plead and call upon the name of God to rend the heavens and come down again, and for the power of the Holy Spirit to arouse and awaken the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ for its effect upon the world. Well. I'm going to close in a word of prayer. We're going to have a short break, and then we'll come back and we'll look at Jonathan Edwards. Let us pray. Father, thank You for this beginning that we've had to our study on the Great Awakening. And Lord, as we read of what You did so long ago, our hearts are, are, are moved within us that You would do it yet again, God, and that You would stir the sleeping giant that You would stir the Bride of Christ, and that You would awaken us all across the land, and that there would be a new day of spiritual hunger and intense longing for the glory of Your name to be restored yet again. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.